We've been talking about Oceania, which is a difficult continent because uh, we know kind of little about it in the islands and, and all the tribes in Papua New Guinea and all that. There are well over a thousand uh, uh, people groups represented, you know, all the indigenous tribes and all that kind of stuff. And then Australia, like how much do we really know about Australia? You know, we're talking about Asia. What are the influences of Asia upon the United States? Well, there's great influence, right? There's been a whole lot of influence in philosophy and all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, food, amen, Asian food. And, and uh, how about Latin America? Well, yeah, there's been a huge influence. I mean, there's a huge population of Latin, uh, Latin Americans and, uh, and the influence, the culture that they brought and all that. And so we've talked about all that. But as far as the Oceania influence, not really as much because for the most part, and it kind of makes sense, historically, people f went from Europe, right? Some fled to the United States, uh, and this is obviously many years later, but then some eventually went to Australia. And so like, it's kind of like both uh, fulfilled the same thing as far as looking for a place where they can have freedom of religion or, or whatever the case. And so I know there's a whole lot more to the history, but I'm just saying that for the most part, those in Australia have been pretty comfortable in living in Australia and, and, and New Zealand and all that. Uh, no real need to, to flee and to run to the United States like some people do from other countries. And also really it's been pretty minimal influence on the United States. So actually on Thursday, I've been trying to talk about how these different continents have, have affected us and influenced us uh, in the United States. And when we got to this Oceania, I was like, well, you know what? I don't really have much to go on to preach a message on that. So let's talk more about, you know, what our, flu our influences have been on, on them. And that's how I dealt with most of the, uh, the sermon. Now we talked about you know, a few things that we know about Australia, for instance, uh, and some of those areas would be like the animals. We all love kangaroos and koalas and the platypus, which is a really weird uh, animal, but actually from uh, that that area. And, uh, and I was like, man, what else has influenced us? I thought about Crocodile Dundee, or at least the image, you know what I mean? Of the like, you know, uh, who's that guy? Uh, he died from a sting from a stingray, and yeah, yeah, that guy, you know, cro by Crocky or whatever. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, we think about that, and that maybe has influenced some somewhat of our culture, and just thinking about that part of the world. Uh, but I thought about another one, boomerangs. I mean, no, that's I heard that that's one of like their biggest imports is the boomerang, and so somebody sent that piece of information to me. Uh, but you know what? None of those things. You know, how do I preach a message on any of those things? And then it dawned on me, something that we have inherited from Australia and New Zealand that maybe you haven't really thought about that, and that is we've gotten a few of their natives as our preachers, our well-influential preachers in the United States, and so I'm going to mention some of them. <laughs> so we started out in 2 Peter 2, a parallel passage is there in Jude, if you'll look there. Now, I'm going to be careful not to preach this because every year it seems like Brother uh, David's been able to give us our, our yearly uh, warning about false prophets. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, uh, but this is a good reminder, right? And Jude, uh, let's talk, let's see, uh, this is a parallel passage, what you just read in 2 Peter. And he says uh, in verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have run, uh, gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for a reward and perished in the gainsay of Korah. And so we've talked about this. I've preached on this as well. And like I mentioned, Brother David has mentioned uh, that there are different types of false prophets, different motivations, different ways in which they present their false teachings and all. And uh, it could be defined in these different ways. Uh, some, we know this, the love of money, right? Filthy lucre. There are, there are those who, you know, preach false doctrines or whatever because of gain. And, and uh, that would be the Balaam way. And then uh, Korah, you know, if you remember the story uh, where Korah brings this group of people to Moses and, and rebukes him and says, hey, you know, we're all holy and who are you? You think you're better than everybody else. And so uh, that was a different type of a false prophet. And then Cain is another false prophet where he actually, you know, relied on the works of his hands, you know, to get him to heaven instead of the, the, what God required, which was a sacrifice 
of, a, of, a, of an animal, right? So this was a great picture of our salvation. We put our faith in what Jesus Christ did for us for our salvation. It has nothing to do with our works, what we can bring to the table. That would be like Cain, and God wasn't impressed with the sacrifices that Cain brought, right? And so he only had, he only had a favor on Abel's sacrifice. And then he told Cain, he said, look, if you would do well, you'd be accepted too. So uh, this is a great picture for us. But the Lord gives us these ideas of different types of false prophets. Okay. And I'm not necessarily in this message uh, seeking out, this isn't one of those, like, let me mark, let me mark all the false prophets and, and I'm going to call out some names, but it's not for the sake of you know, hey, I need to expose this person or that person. That's actually not the point of my message today. But in thinking about these different preachers, I began to think about some things that are out there that we need to be careful about. And I'm just praying God's going to use this because it's a different type of a message. But he's going to use that to help us establish some things that we need to be sound on and that we need to watch for. Because there's the reason that's so much in the Bible about false teachers is because, look, how many times have I said in this month, one out of three people in this world claims to be a Christian. Now, that, if that's true, if one out of three people in the world are saved and going to heaven, right, then why would the Bible say so much about how the, the only few are going to heaven and how the way is narrow and all this kind of stuff? You know, what is the, what is the difference? Okay, so some people out there will say, well, the difference is, you know, some people say they're Christians, but they don't really do the work. Right. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that are relying on their works to get to heaven. And we know that that's actually one of those false teachings, that there's a works based salvation. Not not true. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, tonight. All right. Or this afternoon. All right. So here are some people you may or may not know who came from Australia, New Zealand, that part of the world, Oceania. Okay? These are uh, popular preachers that we have among us today. Number one, I'll start with Ray Comfort. My old, uh, my old buddy I like to preach about. Okay, now here's my problem with Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort is one of the biggest, like, uh, not big, by, by any means, many, many, you know, generations have gone by and people have preached the same thing. But in today's, you know, uh, evangelistic world, he is kind of one of the ones out there well known for the way that he preaches the gospel and his repent of your sins. God, I can hear him say it in his head with his little Aussie uh, sounding voice. Uh, you know, repent of your sins. You got to repent of your sins. And that was a really bad. I think Brother Austin can do a better job. <laughs> okay. So he is really big on repent of your sins. Now, I've tried to give grace to him and be like, maybe I'm misunderstanding what he's saying. You know, historically, I've been like, you know, hey, I know all these preachers who have been influenced by his presentation of the gospel. And here's what I think happened. I'll say YouTube came out, uh, you know, media, mass media uh, being published and all. And, and, you know, that it's hard to get your hand back in the day. It was hard to get your hands on any preaching, any material. And even to this day, a lot of preachers, if you want their material, you got to pay for it. You know, uh, one preacher I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, I was listening to something of his and I wanted to hear his viewpoints, some of his views. And so there was this interview where he was supposed to be talking about this. And throughout the whole thing, he's like, well, if you just get my book, then you'll find out about this and this and this. And I really believe this. I explain it more in my book and in my book and my book and my book. And I'm like, just tell me what you believe. because <laughs> I don't want to have to go buy the book. All right. But uh, but it's all about like, you know, that you, you can't get it. And so you download you try to back in the day, at least it's a lot easier now because live streaming and stuff like that. But back in the day, uh, if you wanted to get some good preaching, you had to pay for it. Even some good preachers that I know, you know, you'd have to go to their website and you'd have to pay for it because they didn't want to just give it away for free. So when people had, when Baptist preachers had at their fingertips, any kind of material, boy, they would download it. They would listen to it or whatever. And out comes this, uh, this Ray Comfort, which I don't think anybody knew anything about. And, uh, and he teams up with, uh, Kirk Cameron, right? And Kirk Cameron was an actor from when I was a kid, you know, uh, what was the name of the show? Growing, Growing Pains. Pains. Thank you. I just want to see how many heathens were out there that was <laughs> <laughs> Growing Pains. I couldn't remember, but I grew up watching that. 
And so I was familiar with Kirk Cameron. So I was like, this is cool. A guy left Hollywood and he's preaching the gospel and all that. He teams up with this guy, Ray Comfort, and they're going on the streets and they're interviewing. And you're like, hey, you know, everyone's talking about, hey, we got to keep the main thing, the main thing. We got to go out and evangelize. We got to go preach the gospel. And nobody's doing it, it seems like. That's how I felt. And so now here's a guy that's on the streets. He's doing it. He's going to show us how. And so people were just watching this and they're eating it up. And he's put out a lot of documentaries and videos and he puts them for free on YouTube. And so people are just listening. So I think what happened is a lot of Baptist pastors had some resources at their fingertips. And so they listened to him. And I've heard so many Baptist preachers start giving the gospel and it bing, I can hear the key words. And I'm like, they've been listening to Ray Comfort and they're giving the Ray Comfort presentation. Okay. Now let me tell you what the Ray Comfort presentation is. He starts off by saying, you know, do you, basically, do you think you're going to heaven? And they say, yeah, yeah, I've been a pretty good person, right? We hear that all the time. We understand. We're familiar with that. And so then he starts going through the Ten Commandments. Well, have you ever told a lie? You know, oh yeah, maybe you told a lie before. Well, the Bible says all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone. And he says, have you ever uh, looked on a, a woman to lust after? in your heart. The Bible says that's like committing adultery. You've committed adultery. Have you ever used the name of the Lord in vain? Yes. Well, then you're a blasphemer. So by your definition, you're a lying, thieving, you know, uh, adulterous blasphemer. And this is what, this is the, the routine. If you've ever heard that presentation, that's a, they got that from Ray Comfort. And, uh, I mean, you know, it's the 10 commandments are in the Bible, but I'm just saying that, that Ray Comfort decided, well, here's what we need to do. We need to focus the attention on the commandments and on the, the rules and the laws of the Bible. And we have to make sure that people understand that even though they think that they're good, we understand people think that they're good enough to go to heaven. That's the big problem, okay? But his purpose was to, to, to change their mind into thinking, wow, I really do deserve to go to hell, okay? So up until this point, I mean, even if a Baptist preacher uses that, says, hey, I think that's a great way to start, you know, I don't really particularly think you need to spend 20 minutes convincing somebody they're a sinner. I think usually people are honest with themselves and they're like, you know what, I deserve to go to hell because I've sinned against God. Uh, but for the most part, you know, people think, no, we need to keep driving it home, make them feel really guilty, make them feel really sad about their sins. <clears throat> so they'll do something about it. Now, here's the problem is that comfort stops short and again, I'm actually not trying to expose false prophets, but if you learn the problems, uh, then maybe you'll understand what's wrong with some of the people that are, uh, that are doing these things. But Ray Comfort will stop short of telling them how to be saved. And basically what he says is this. He says, well, you need to stop doing those things. If those are the things that are going to send you to hell, you need to stop doing those things. And he puts a big emphasis on that. He says, you need to repent of your sins. And he defines it and says, repent of your sins means turn from your sins, right? Stop doing those. Those are bad things. Those are sins against God. You need to stop doing those things. Now, I don't believe, and he even says himself, you know, that people are still going to sin. You know, nobody's perfect. I think he admits that. But, but the terminology that he's using makes these people think, well, man, you know, how in the world? I mean, I've been living a pretty rotten life. What can I do to, to be saved? And now he left them with, you need to stop doing that. You need to repent of that. And then he leaves with this second thing. He says, and the second thing you have to do, he flat out says, the second thing you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ, right? And believe in him for your, the payment of your sins and all that kind of stuff. And so he gets that from the Bible. He says, uh, where the Bible says, uh, you need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's saying that you need to repent, number one. And then number two, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so people are left with this. There's no like, well, let's take care of this right now. Let's, you know, let's call on the Lord to save you or any. There's no closure to it. It's just now think about this. Go read your Bible. Go figure out what you're doing wrong and stop sinning. And then when, you when you're ready to repent, then you can call on the Lord to save you. Right. But I'm telling you what that leads to because I've seen it my whole life. And my wife can attest to it. And she struggled with this whenever she was younger. What it leads to is this thought, I'm not saved because I haven't cleaned up my life. And there's no way God's going to accept me or listen to me or save me until I get my life clean. And here's the bad news. You will never get your life clean enough to go to heaven. It's just not possible. And that's the whole gospel message is that there is such a great gulf between you and heaven 
and where God lives and his holiness and his righteousness, that there's no way you can ever get there on your own by your own goodness. It's not possible because nobody is good enough. Jesus was the only one that could fill that gap. Okay. And excuse me for using an illustration my own illustration, but here's what I use a lot of times whenever I'm given the gospel, just to help people understand what, what I mean by this. I often use the idea of the Grand Canyon, okay? Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? You'll know this, that I could never jump from one side of the Grand Canyon to the other side of the Grand Canyon. There's just no way. That would be absurd for me to even try, right? <clears throat> but you've seen some of these Olympian athletes, they could jump three, four times farther than I can. Why well, hey, let this guy have a, cha- a shot? Maybe he, maybe he can get across the Grand Canyon, right? He's not going to make it either. The be- if you could find, I don't know how you'd ever decide this because we don't know people's hearts and we don't know what sins people have in the closet and whatever, but if you could just find the perfect, like the best person in this world, you know, outside of Jesus Christ, the one human that's lived the best life, maybe the Apostle Paul, I don't know. Well, here's the thing, the Apostle Paul, called himself the chief of sinners. And he said, I struggle daily, right? With, between the flesh and the spirit, they're at war with each other. So uh, if you can find the greatest Christian, he's still going to fall short. He can't get to heaven, okay? And so, and regardless, because there are people that use the term repent of your sins and they don't mean you need to stop sinning. But regardless, when you use that terminology and you convince people that, you know, there's something that they have to do to be saved and they have to turn from their sins and they have to, you know, uh, sorrow and weep and mourn and cry or whatever. And you start thinking, now they're going to be thinking, well, how can I ever know for sure I'm going to heaven? Because I haven't sorrowed enough. I haven't repented of my sins enough. I haven't done any. How do I know that I've done anything enough? Right? So they have to believe this is the only thing that will save somebody. They have to believe that, you know what? There's nothing I can do to save myself. I need to put all of my faith on Jesus Christ. It's like going across that Grand Canyon. How am I getting across? A helicopter maybe, right? Or some kind of a, uh, you know, airplane or whatever. That's the only way I'm getting from one side to the other. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, when a person realizes that and the light bulb goes off and they say, wow, how refreshing. This is good news. This, you know, that's what the gospel means is good news. This is good news. I can't save myself. Jesus died for my sins. I put my faith in him. He gets me to the other side. He saves me. That's good news. What's not good news is, well, if you want to be saved, you got to turn from your sins. Because we all know that in this flesh, we struggle all the time with sins. Now, we should try to live holy. We should try to live right with God. But we are always going to struggle with that. And so God uh, has put in the, I mean, look, from page one, Sin after sin after sin, and everyone's falling short, and everybody, you know, we're God's people, but now they're going after idols, and they're going after the, it's just to show us that we are all, you know, unworthy, we're all falling short of the glory of God, and if we get what we deserve, we would all go to hell, but thankfully, Jesus Christ died for our sins. So few people in this world will receive that message, and genuinely put their faith in Jesus Christ, because they all want to put the emphasis on themselves, and they think that they can uh, turn over a new leaf and be saved. So here's the problem with Ray Comfort. It's not that he's from New Zealand. I don't care. That's great. Welcome all the New Zealanders over to the United States. That's fine. But my problem with him is that he's preaching a false gospel, which we call Lordship Salvation. If I had a chart that showed, you know, uh, the different doctrines or whatever as they rise throughout history, I would say right now, Lordship Salvation in our in our world is just like it is just going up to the top. I don't know how that's going to play into, you know, the great falling away or something like that. But I'm telling you, that's what all the Baptists are turning to. That's what all the denominations. It's all becoming this like ecumenical one world. You know, hey, you can call yourself whatever you want as long as you believe in the in the Lordship, repent of your sins, salvation uh, gospel. And so it's really dangerous. And that's why I get so uh, worked up about it and, and talk a lot uh, about it a lot. Look at Acts chapter eight. I mean, we, we want to make it easy for people to come to the Lord. We don't want to put obstacles and stumbling blocks in our way and say, well, if you can get over the hurdle, then you can be saved. That's not the gospel of the, of the Bible. <clears throat> Look at Acts chapter 8. Verse 37.
This is, you know, Phil, uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is asking Philip what he, what he has to do to be saved or what he has to do in order to be baptized. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. What is he supposed to believe with all his heart? Well, we understand that when we see the rest of his answer. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went, both, uh, they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, I don't have time to preach on this, but baptism isn't what saves him. And, uh, and the Bible's very clear on that. The thing is, he was baptized after he was saved. So what saved him was putting his faith in, in Jesus Christ. He said, I believe he's the son of God. What was just shown to him when, he, he, when Philip was preaching to him, he's preaching to him that he's the son of God. He came and was, was wounded for our iniquities and all that. And so, uh, and so he, was showing, he was preaching him the gospel through the Old Testament. Look at chapter uh, uh, Acts chapter 4. But I showed you that to show you that he didn't make this big ordeal. He showed him the gospel and he said, hey, if you believe with all your heart, you can be baptized. I'll trust that you're saved if you tell me you believe with all your heart. Well, wait a minute. Let's wait for a while and see if the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, you know, start changing his life. Let's see if he is faithfully attending church for his uh, sins or whatever. No, he doesn't say that anywhere. He just says, if you believe with all your heart, you can be baptized, right? Which means we'll trust that I'll trust that you're saved and I'll baptize you. Well, that's easy believism. Well, that's what Philip did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a misconception, you know, and I've said this before. I don't embrace the phrase easy believism because I know because of the way that I grew up and the circles I was in, what people mean when they say easy believism. And it's not really just that it's a simple plan of salvation because it is a simple plan of salvation. Right. But some people uh, don't like that phrase. But there's a thing. It is a simple plan. Jesus did all the work. We put our faith in him. And we're saved, okay? And so uh, we don't want to make it more complicated than that, but we do want to be thorough and make sure people understand, you know, who the Jesus of the Bible, who we're talking about, what it is that they're putting their faith in. And, and in order to put their faith in them, they do have to stop believing the false, the false teaching that, that their works will save them or maybe that, you know, there's another God because a lot of people can accept Christianity, but they believe in what this, and I've preached a lot about this this, this month on syncretism, like these indigenous religions will often become Christians, but then they just keep all their pagan beliefs. They still worship their ancestors and trust in their idols and stuff like that, but they call themselves Christians. No, no, obviously that's not trusting in the Lord with all your heart. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, you're going to say, well, those other things are false, right? This is the truth. And so, uh, and so that's the only uh, that's the only change that there needs to be is an uh, uh, is an understanding of what the truth is and putting your faith in that. Acts chapter four four. Howbeit many of them, when they heard the word, believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. Now in Acts chapter two, it said uh, uh, a similar thing. It said uh, then they that in verse forty one they that gladly received the word. In the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So you got 3,000 there. You got 5,000 in chapter 4. And, you know, that dwarfs this number on the back of our wall. You think, man, for this whole year, you guys really believe that you got 134 people saved? All I know is that we preach the gospel and that many people, through all of our efforts, right, of, of spreading the gospel, scattering the seed, that many people said, I believe that message. You know, I changed my mind on what I believed before. I believe that, and I want to call on the Lord to save me, right? Now, it doesn't matter really the rest of the, of the fact. I mean, people might want to know, like, well, how many are going out? How many doors are you knocking? How many hours are you giving the gospel? What are you telling them? What, you know, look, we're happy to explain all that kind of stuff, but really, let's think about it. None of that matters. Because here one message was preached and 3,000 people got saved. One message was preached and 5,000 people got saved. <laughs> In the other case, Philip preaches to one man, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, and he gets saved. But there's no requirement for them to change their lives. It just says they believed and they were saved. Now you could put after that, yeah, but the Bible says if you're saved, you're going to do this and faith without works is dead and all these kind of things. You can add all that to that. But that's a message for another day, because when it comes to salvation, your salvation is based by simply believing 
which means putting your trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation, your eternal secure, your eternal salvation. Okay, so Ray Comfort and people like that. I could mention a whole bunch of guys. Probably one of the biggest key uh, proponents of the Lordship Salvation is John MacArthur, but uh, but and a lot of guys reference him. But Ray Comfort is from New Zealand, so there you go. <laughs> All right, uh, number two. Right, and again. I'm not trying to call out names and, and call everybody a false uh, teacher or anything. I'm just simply mentioning some preachers that are from uh, Oceania, okay? Number two is Ken Ham. Now, Ken Ham is very influential because of Answers in Genesis. It's a big website or a big uh, ministry that he has, and he deals a lot with creationism and uh, Noah's Ark particularly. Uh, we've been out to the Ark Encounter. It's a great experience. I think it was neat to go there and see the, uh, you know, his, his, you know, obviously they're just kind of theories as to how the Ark could have looked and how they could have worked in all these little sections and all that. And all throughout the Ark Encounter, there are like, uh, you know, there are, are our messages posted or, or different illustrations or whatever that point to the salvation message. Okay. And I'll tell you this, I went there and I went to the museum and I felt like he was right on in the gospel. Now others have showed like, no, he says, repent of your sins and he does this and that. All I'm saying is that the message that I saw presented at the Ark Encounter and at the museum, I feel like people could have totally got saved by that message. Okay. So uh, I also know this, that Ken Ham had a debate with Bill Nye, the science guy. Anybody ever watch it by any chance? Okay. You guys are like, I don't care. <laughs> I understand. Debates are the most boring thing in the world. I watched it and it was a long debate. But here's the thing that I remember watching it in that impressed me about Ken Ham. Now I'm not trying to, like I could probably unveil some of his false doctrines or whatever, but I'm just, I'm just mentioning what, whatever comes to mind really at this point. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, so Ken Ham had this, had this debate with Bill Nye. Bill Nye tried to throw all the science out there about, uh, you know, global warming and about, you know, the evolution and all this. And, and he was just trying to do everything he could to just prove Ken Ham wrong and to show how evolution is right and all this. And I was really impressed about this, that Ken Ham didn't even really, even though it was called a debate and it got worldwide press and everybody was watching, he actually spent very little time trying to defend the Bible and instead took every opportunity he could to just preach the gospel. I don't know if, if you ever watched that. I thought it was pretty interesting. Now, mo most people were like, oh, he did a terrible job. He lost the debate. I caught right away that he wasn't even debating. He was just using this platform to preach the gospel to people. And I thought that was great. Okay. Uh, and I don't remember this great repent of your sins, like works based salvation. I just remember him preaching about Jesus Christ and about his, the authority being the Bible, the word of God and all that. And I thought that was great. Now, after going on his website and looking at the statement of faith and seeing some different things, yes, the whole repent of your sins things really kind of muddies muddies it up and people can get confused on that. And by the way, none of these guys are King James only. So that's already, that's already a huge negative in my, in my book. But, uh, <clears throat> so there were some things that were muddy. There were some things that I didn't like, uh, Ken Ham's been accused of doing it all for the money. And of course, all the atheists and all are trying everything they can to get his and show how he's supposed, he should be paying taxes for all this. And he's using it illegally as a nonprofit. But, you know what? I, you know, I don't, I could really care less about that. Um, I don't feel like he's in it for the money. Uh, I think he gives a lot of stuff away, you know, for free and all that. Guys have quite a bit of money. Um, and he's no exception. I don't know his net worth or anything like that. But he uses, by the way, some similarity, uh, in his presentation, possible, you know, some Ray comfort ish, type approaches. But <clears throat> I read a book and I think more so here's his philosophy. His philosophy is people in the world today are getting so far removed from, uh, from, from the Bible vernacular that they don't even know 
what the Bible teaches and they don't know that they're sinners and they don't know all this. So he's big on, hey, we need to get back to Genesis and we need to teach them about the origins of the earth and, and about the, you know, the how things got here. And he wants to, you know, he has a group of scientists and all working with him that tries to prove that the Bible is accurate and that, sal and that uh, creation happened the way the Bible says and about the flood and all that. And I'll just tell you this. I fell into it for a while with Ken Ham and, uh, and Kent Hoven and uh, some other guys. I fell into this like just really wanting to learn about creationism and how can I prove the evolution is wrong and how can I prove that the Bible is true and how could I prove the, you know, Jesus Christ and how can I prove that to those who don't believe in the Bible? And the, the conclusion I came up with is you can't. Right? You can't prove to somebody who doesn't believe the Bible that there was a Jesus Christ. They'll even tell you Jesus Christ didn't exist or something like that. And you can say, oh no, but let me prove it to you that there was a... Look, every time they write the date on their check and it says 2021, what they're saying is 2021 years ago, Christ, you know, was on this earth, okay? But they still reject that he even exists or that he was anybody, anything special, right? They just, they could care less. They just want to believe what they want to believe. The Bible says that uh, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God. And it talks about those who are willingly ignorant, okay? They're they remain ignorant on purpose. And the truth is, there is no debating with an atheist. There is no debating with a, a evolutionist that has just decided that science is their God and they don't want to consider the Bible at all. You're wasting your time, right? And so I, I believe in many ways, his ministry of trying to prove the Bible and prove uh, creation and prove Noah's Ark is kind of a waste of time, right? What you could be doing is just going out there, preaching the gospel and telling people what the Bible says. Now, if he uses it and presents the gospel to people that come through and people are getting saved, well, praise the Lord for that. Uh, but I just don't think that is, uh, that is necessary. Now, I will say this. Uh, I, I was kind of excited because I saw where in the Philippines there was a guy... Uh, there's a, I don't know, somehow their ministry, they have a ministry from Answers in Genesis in the Philippines. And this guy claimed that over the time that they've been here, I don't know how many years they've been working this ministry. They say they've seen over like 60,000 people come to the Lord. And if you preach the gospel and you say that you've seen that number of people saved, you know, that gives me hope that you're probably preaching, that you, you probably have the right idea about the gospel and you're not going out there just saying, well, you just got to repent of your sins because then you don't know how many people got saved, right? You're just like trusting like, well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Who knows? But look, that's not the Bible way. In the Bible way, now they might not, you might not be a bunch of evidence where they said, hey, let's bow and repeat after me prayer or something like that. But what we do see in the Bible is that there was a way that they knew this person believes. So we're, so we're counting them as a salvation. We're counting them one of the 3,000, one of the 5,000. You know, this person believed with all their heart. They confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus. We're claiming them to be saved, right? We get a lot of flack here. Like, Who are you to claim somebody to be saved? Well, the Bible claims when people get saved by one preacher preaching and then all these people get saved. All right, so anyway, but I got off on that because here's this guy in the Philippines, right? And here's what it said, and this was... I, I had great hope for it. And then again, it muddies up the waters a little bit on the presentation. Let me, or, or on what, what he says. It says, it says, Dr. Jerry Lawton says that when Filipino students hear his message on creation, their tears and intense silence at the end are evidence of their inward conviction of sin. They welcome the closing sinner's prayer as an opportunity to get things right with the creator who will someday judge them. Now I got a little bit of a problem because it sounds to me what he's saying is, you know, hey, you are going to die in your sins. You know, you're going to be judged by God. And, and in your current state, you're going to die in your sins. Now, who wants to be saved? And then they just raise their hand and they say, okay, let's say a sinner's prayer. You know, I see little evidence that he actually preached the gospel. In fact, what he's looking for is people who are crying, people who are convicted, people who are just, their jaws are open and they're just in silence and all that stuff. And I'm going to tell you this. Let me just tell you my own testimony. Seven, eight-year-old boy, you know, I went to a, a, a children's program. I want, it was an Awana program back when they used the King James Version. <laughs> and so I went to uh, Awana as a seven, eight-year-old kid. And 
you know, played the games. And at the end, we're going to have a Bible study. And the guy said, hey, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven whenever you die? Now, I don't remember the exact words of everything he said, but I know this was in a nutshell what happened. And I said, no. I remember him even saying, using, I do remember him saying the words, have you ever been saved? And I was like, no, no, I've never been saved. He began to show me what the Bible said. You know, probably Romans Road. I don't remember the exact verses. that he. And at the end of that, he led me in a prayer. If I'm, I'm pretty sure he led me in a prayer. Like I remember the, the vague, I know that I, I walked away believing in Jesus Christ for my, for, as my Savior and uh, for the payment of my sins and all that kind of stuff. But I'm seven years old, right? So how many of you think that I walked away just crying? You know, oh, thank you so much. I thought I was going to hell and now I know God is so good. I'm just going to change my ways and I'm going to do. No, I went home. Doop, 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 doop. Oh, yeah. Guess what, mom and dad? I'm going to heaven when I die. Doop, 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 doop. <laughs> Sometimes when people get saved, no tears, no heavy conviction other than the fact that, hey, if I don't accept this, I'm going to hell. That's what the Holy Spirit's job is, not ours. We can't force it. We can't make it. People are always like, oh, well, the Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts. Well, sure. So if it's his job, then just leave it alone. Preach the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do his job. <laughs> All right. Well, I just don't know. Well, you're not the judge. The Holy Spirit is. Okay. So you preach the gospel. If they accept it, praise the Lord. Right. No. Do we think 100% of the people who make a profession are saved? No, I've followed up on some and I've found out that they weren't saved. They didn't get it. They, they did what the Apostle Paul said. They believed in vain. They said they believed, but it was empty. It, it wasn't a real belief. They didn't actually get it. They were just nice people that wanted us to get off their doorstep. <laughs> okay. And that's okay. We still got to preach the gospel to them. But we know that many of them truly do receive it. And we hope that it's the, the majority of them. <clears throat> so this guy was putting a little bit too much emphasis, sounds like to me, like this inward conviction. And then he said this, uh, they, they need the opportunity to get things right with the creator who will someday judge them. Now, the creator is the judge. God the Father is the final judge. Yes, one day all men will stand before him. But there's a little bit of a confusion. Some people act like, hey, no matter who you are, doesn't matter. One day you're going to stand before God and God's going to have this giant TV screen and he's going to unveil to the world like every sin that you've ever committed. It's just going to unfold and you're going to be like, oh, don't look, guys. Oh, I didn't want you to see that. Oh, I didn't. and you're going to be embarrassed because of all your sins. So you better start getting your act, act together and clean up. But that's not what the Bible teaches about judgment. Here's when Jesus comes back, it says he brings the Lord with him. Okay, The moment that he, that he takes up believers in what we would call the rapture, right? when he receives be the believers, those who, you know, you can read about it in 1 Corinthians 15. Or, I mean, uh, let's see, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, lots of places in the Bible. <laughs> he says, uh, he says you, will, you go up, he's coming with his reward and he will, he will give every man according to his works. Here's what he means. You are saying, and I can show you this, 1 Corinthians 3 as well, uh, if you get a chance to read that, that'll help you. Okay, uh, he is saying that when he comes, if you're saved, you will go to heaven, right, to be with the Lord. You know, so shall I ever be with the Lord. And he will distribute rewards. And I don't know what those rewards are exactly, but he will distribute rewards ba based on what you've done on this earth. Everything else has been, ha well, let's just turn there because I think some people might not know this, this verse and it's really helpful. 1 Corinthians 3. And I'll have to find it, but it's in here. Look at verse, uh, verse 11. And this would line up with 2 Peter 2 uh, that talks about adding to your faith, virtue and knowledge and all that. Okay, faith is the foundation. Faith is the salvation. After you're saved, that you add upon that so that you will not be empty handed and that you'll produce fruit and you'll be rewarded, uh, you know, a hundredfold in the life to come. Look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, all right, so he's talking about saved people who have their faith in Jesus Christ. That means they're saved. They put their faith in Jesus Christ. And now he says, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, all right? I'm emphasizing this break right here that's not necessarily there, but here's the other group of elements. Wood, hay, stubble, 
Every man's work shall be man made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he have built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. All right, so the things you did for Christ, the things that you added to that foundation, which is your salvation through Jesus Christ, those gold, silver, precious stone, those are what you're going to get rewarded for because you did, you did things that counted for Christ. You laid up treasures in heaven instead of here on earth. All the other things that you did in this life, wood, hay, stubble, it's going to be burned up. And it says, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You see what I'm saying? So the Bible teaches that you could get to heaven and... You know what? If you get to heaven, your eternal life is secure. You've got everlasting life. But when you are handed out, when he comes to handing out rewards, you get nothing. <laughs> okay? Because you didn't lay up anything upon that, build anything upon that, that foundation. Now you got eternal life. Praise the Lord for that. I don't know what the rewards uh, are in addition to that. Some think in the millennial kingdom in a thousand years, it has to do with, uh, you know, you'll be over this many cities or you'll be over. Who knows what that what that has to do. But the point is, we want to make our Lord happy, right? We want to please him. We want to accomplish great things for him. And he's going to reward us somehow. Right? It's not, he's not going to be forgetful of the things that we did for him. Now, uh, now in, uh, in the book of Revelation, it talks about what we call the great white throne judgment. All right. Now, when we talk about everybody standing before God and being judged according to their works, what we usually mean are those who are not saved. Okay, if you were saved, you went up in the rapture, you have an immortal body, you're good to go. All right. But you're you you're still have rewards given out to you. If you're not saved, read Revelation 20. And what you find out is there's a final judgment at what's called the second resurrection. Okay. Those who are in the second resurrection are those who were not in the millennial kingdom. They were not saved. They didn't rule and reign with Christ. Now they're standing before God and they're going to say, what, what Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, how many will come before him and say, Lord, Lord, you know, I prophesied in your name and in your name I did many wonderful things. And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Okay, I think that's what he's talking about because there's a great white throne judgment where people will say, no, God, I deserve to go to heaven. Look at my works. Then he might say, okay, you want to look at your works? Let's get out the TV <laughs> and begin to see your work. And you'll be like, never mind, never mind, I'm a sinner. All right. <laughs> All right, and then the Bible makes it clear whose ever name was not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. In the book of life, those who received Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, not by those who tried to work their way to heaven because they're going to be judged according to their works and they're all going to come short. Okay, so the only ones uh, who will receive salvation are the ones who got there by Jesus Christ because they had that which is foundational, which is faith in Jesus Christ. All right. I'm going to skip. Uh, I'm going to skip the next one because it's. Uh, I just was just looking up preachers that came out of that area, and Michael Youssef is one of them. I really didn't study a whole lot about him. I don't know that much about him. I'll tell you this: I saw his salvation. I mean, I saw his salvation presentation, and even though it was super, super short and quick, you know, like I almost have more confidence in what he gave. You know, than those people who are like, well, you got to turn from your sins and all this kind of stuff. All right. But I'll say this. He's uh, he's apostolic, which would be a charismatic idea. Uh, I don't think he practices speaking in tongues, but he believes that that is something that people can do after they're saved to edify themselves and and uh, whatever. So I had some stuff written on that. But for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. Probably one of our. Best, uh, uh, let me see here. I want to say. I don't want to say imports. Okay, no, actually, he, I believe he's still in, in Australia, actually, okay. This would be Hillsong. I mentioned him briefly on, Hillsong briefly on Thursday. Now, Hillsong started in Australia. And all I know is the guy's name is Brian Houston, is the pastor there. And his dad, I believe his name was Frank Houston. He's actually the one that moved the family out there and said, hey, let's go to uh, Australia I think they were in New Zealand at the time. They said, let's go to Australia and let's start this work. And they started a ministry and it grew and a lot of people started coming. Eventually it got turned over to his son, Brian Houston. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it became known as Hillsong. 
Okay. Now Hillsong historically was called a uh, AOG or Assemblies of God Church, okay? which means it's charismatic. It was also he's also really big, just kind of like uh, uh, Joel Osteen, you know, with the kind of word of truth, prosperity gospel. You just want to, you know, God wants us all to be. Uh, happy and have good marriages and like just uh, be healthy and all this kind of stuff. And so, so some people teach like that's, you know, that's God's blessings. That's what he wants you to be. If anything else happens, it wasn't because it was either because you weren't living right. And so he's, and so, you know, I don't know, they teach some weird things, but I'm going to tell you this just flat out. There's what I believe this work is all about the money. Okay. This prosperity gospel, it's all about the money. I need to say nice things to scratch your ears. The Bible talks about that. And I need to say nice things not to offend you. And if, and, and all these guys, like whenever they go on national TV and somebody asks them like Oprah Winfrey, so do you think that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven? They'll be like, well, <laughs> he's a way to get to heaven. I mean, I think he's my way to get to heaven, but I'm not going to judge people who no, that's flat out somebody who's rejecting Jesus Christ because they love filthy lucre. They love money. And they know that if I say that, I'm going to be blacklisted and they're going to just shut down, you know, my, my ministry, stop buying my books or whatever. Okay. So these people we're talking about making millions and millions and millions of dollars, which in and of itself, I guess, isn't necessarily bad. But I'll tell you this, anyone that's got millions and millions of dollars who's in the ministry, yeah, something's a little fishy because the Bible says all those who live godly shall suffer persecution. And I don't think you're going to be liked and loved by all people if you're preaching the truth from the Bible. All right, so, uh, but here's the biggest contribution from Hillsong. Okay, let me first say this. This is super important. So just recently, like I think this year or maybe last year, and I don't know whatever came of this, but Brian Houston was, uh, was also... Um, charged with covering up sexual abuse, okay? Now, the guy that started Hillsong in New York City was actually fired because he was having an affair on his wife, and then they found out that he had had multiple experiences like that and a whole bunch of weird things that he did uh, with his money and all that kind of stuff, so he ended up getting fired. But in in Australia, um, what happened was, remember I said Frank Houston moved the family there, started the work, it got real big, and then Brian Houston took over? Well, the accusation on Brian is that he covered for his father. Turns out his father, Frank Houston, had committed or ha uh, was a pedophile and had molested or, or, or abused many, 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 uh, I don't know how many exactly, but they said many um, and he confessed to it before he died, uh, many little boys, you know, and there's records of him even while he's preaching, calling somebody out uh, that's a boy in the congregation and saying some very awkward things like, why would he say that? And here's a guy that, you know, uh, you know, love of money is the root of all evil. So, you know, sometimes I think people, they start out, they just love money and they, they want more things and they want fame and all that stuff. But I'm telling you the end result of somebody who's not a believer who would do, you know, pretend to be a Christian, for example, when they're not Christian, they don't really believe that they're, they're just filthy lucre. You know what I mean? The end result is Romans one type reprobate. You're turned over to a reprobate mind you know, God's done with you, and uh, and this is what this is what we see. So surprise, surprise, you know, he ended up being a pedophile and homosexual and and all that stuff. Which, again, in the media, you get Brian Houston up there and you say, "What do you think about homosexuals in your church?" And he said, "I just found out the other day." He said, "I got we've got some homosexual couples in our choir," and he said, "I don't think the lifestyle is right." He said, but I'm never going to be the kind of church that says, you know, hey, you can't be in the choir because you're this or because you're that. And I'm thinking, does this guy even read the Bible? <laughs> you know, does he, uh, uh, what, you know, what is he, does he not going to discipline anybody? Is he just going to let anybody be a member and anybody be welcome to his church? That's a big, big problem that I'll preach about on another day. Okay, but uh, so there are some very shady things with him. And again, uh, although I don't mind doing it, my, the purpose of this message isn't to call out false prophets. It's just to talk about some of the things that, uh, that are out there. And it just so happens that these are the ones that came from uh, Australia. We love Australia. Nothing wrong with them. It's just uh, they've been subjected to some uh, false preachers. 
Okay, but the big thing is probably the biggest contribution from Hillsong is the contemporary Christian music, all right? I, I don't see a reason to, and I'm kind of out of time anyway. So uh, I wrote lyrics down to the most popular songs. It's a little bit old, older. I think it's a few years old. Uh, but I read all these songs, and I've talked on the subject before. But here was the biggest thing that just kept coming to my mind, is that these are all pretty songs, like like make you feel good songs. And people want to turn to that because, you know, music can make you feel good. I know people who are drug addicts who, you know, substitute sometimes music or sometimes they go hand in hand. They do the drugs and the music, but they'll substitute music. And they say the music just makes them forget their sorrows and forget their woes. And so they just drown themselves in the music. And I'm telling you, music can be like a drug. And sometimes people will turn to the music to make them feel good and they're denying, like instead of just actually thinking about what God wants and thinking about the scripture and thinking about what's right and wrong. So Ephesians uh, uh, 5 talks about, you know, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So this is very clear, you know, that, that the type of music that we sing is with the sound mind. You know, and it's supposed to be edifying. Colossians 3 is a parallel passage, about edifying one another, so uh, or exhorting one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And so there's a purpose for music. It's not just to make us feel good. And all these songs, in fact, the lady that wrote this article that listed the top 10 uh, songs that are sung from, from Hillsong in churches today, she gives a little... Uh, a little summary before she gives her favorite lyrics from there. And it's, it's stuff like this. The beat of this song brings you right into the lyrics of hope, what God's love truly means. And then you read the lyrics and you're like, it's just kind of all feel good, you know, just kind of like forget about your sorrows and forget about this. Remember prosperity gospel. So it all fits kind of hand to hand, uh, you know, um, anyway, that's just kind of, that's just kind of how they are. And if you listen to the words, and try not to get caught up in the beat and the emotion of the song and just listen to the words. You'll find a lot of times it's just kind of like cloud, like clouds without water. You know what I mean? It's just like they're just pretty vain and, and, and empty. And look, there's some songs in our songbook that are that, are that way too. Uh, I'm not trying to say, you know, every song that we sing. There's some songs that I could pull out from, from the book of Psalms that David wrote that I'm like, that seems pretty shallow. I mean, you know, so I'm not trying to make a case for that. I'm just saying... Look, music needs to be edifying in the right ways. It needs to bring us to the Lord. It needs to bring us to a sound mind where we can ex be exhorted and edified. It doesn't have to be something that just makes us feel good. I heard it put this way one time. I always thought this is a great thing, so I want to share it. But they said that the word uh, muse, right, to, to muse over something has to do with, like, thinking, you know, musing, you know, uh, uh, so music is actually something that should be something that requires thought. And, uh, you, know, you know, most people, when they're listening to music, they have no idea what the lyrics are. How many, <laughs> how many of you guys ever grew up? I grew up listening to a lot of songs, no idea what I was singing. I was just kind of imitating the sounds. And then all of a sudden one day you're like, whoa, I didn't know I was, I didn't know the, <laughs> that was in that song, <laughs> right? You're saying some bad word or something. And, uh, and the thing is, a lot of times the music just puts you at a like almost transcendental state. Like you're not really thinking about the words. Music should mean something. This is why back in the day, classical music and all that was very like, you know, like uh, intellectual, right? I'm not, it's not my style. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily enjoy all the classical music, but, uh, but that was the idea was that these musicians were actually trying to produce something that with meaning and all the songwriters of the early uh, hymns that we read in, from our hymn book today, like they really tried to match the music up with the words and make sure that the words were actually edifying and they were doctrinally sound and all that stuff because we're supposed to muse over that. Okay. But then I heard the same person, I don't remember his name, but he was, uh, he preached a seminar on that. And he said, but today's, what we want is amusement. Okay. Amusement has to do with not thinking, just being entertained and, uh, and, and not having to think about it at all. Right. And so really we need to get back to, especially when we're, when it has to do with glorifying God, music that actually means something. Okay? And we need to make sure that our doctrine that we're listening to is sound. I've listened to a lot of preaching online and all just for whatever reason it's on. 
And sometimes I don't realize until later on that this person is actually a heretic, but they said a few things that sounded really good. You know, they're, they're saying the, the basics of the faith that we've all learned. I mean, you know, even the Catholics can are right on the Trinity and there's some things they could say that you're like, Hey man, that's exactly right. You know, Jesus was born of a virgin and all that kind of stuff. But we have to be careful to think through, have a sound mind and to be sober and to realize what it is that they're teaching before we just kind of spout it off and, and fall into false heresy. So anyway, don't know what ha that has to do with Australia, except for those preachers came out of Australia, but uh, or that area of the world anyway. But hopefully, uh, may maybe it helps clarify some things for some people. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you help us to be of a sound mind and to be sober-minded. Help us to... Uh, uh, not be weary of working for you and laying up treasures in heaven. But most importantly, Lord, help us realize uh, the foundation of our faith is not based on our works or our good deeds or, or our ability to repent properly or, or uh, look a certain way or whatever the case. Lord, help us realize that it's all based on what Jesus did. And help us just humble ourselves enough to realize it has nothing to do with us and empty ourselves of any pride and just realize that you alone are, uh, are perfect and you alone can uh, have the ability to uh, pay that price for our sins. Lord, we trust you. We give you thanks for that. We're thankful that we call you Father. We're thankful that we've entered into a legally binding contract, Lord, that we are saved for all eternity and that there's nothing we could ever do to not be your children, because we've been born of the Spirit. And so I pray, Lord, that as your children and, and being born in the Spirit, that we would walk in the Spirit. And I pray that you'll help us to daily die to self and daily to try to get ourselves in a position where we're living right for you, we're living holy, uh, we're out there trying to produce fruit and see people saved. And you even said, Lord, that uh, that charity will cover a multitude of sins, Lord. So I pray you help us to live a life of charity, live a life of giving the gospel to others freely and live a life of, of uh, loving and showing mercy and, and, and at all possible living peaceable with all men, Lord, because you have given us so much. Freely you have given, Lord, help us to freely give. In Jesus' name I pray.